Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas B. Miras. Today I'm talking to Scott Hambrick about the online program he founded, which facilitates the reading and studying of the great books of Western civilization. Hey, everybody. For a long time, I have been planning to embark on a somewhat organized chronological study of the great books of the Western world, uh, according more or less to the list made by Mortimer Adler. But I've always thought I would get a lot more out of it if I were to have a group of people with which to discuss these. But of course, uh, it's a long list, and it's really hard to get a group of people together to discuss just one book, let alone commit to a very long-term schedule of reading and discussion over a period of years. So I never quite figured out what to do with that until I found this online program called Online Great Books. It started about a year and a half ago. I enrolled back in August, and it has been so much fun, not only reading these books, but especially the experience of going into the seminar every month. Uh, That has been invaluable just really fun and exciting experience of discovering these works along with a group of great people. So joining me today is the founder of Online Great Books, Scott Hambrick, to talk about the program. As it happens, there is a new enrollment period going on right now for about five days after this episode comes out. And if you use the discount code Catholic Culture, you will get 25% off the first three months of your Online Great Books subscription. And what's also nice about that is that Catholic Culture will be getting a very nice kickback from everybody who subscribes via our referral link, so that's a good way of supporting us as well. You can find the link at catholicculture.org slash episode 27. Scott Hambrick, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thanks, man. Good to be here. You have started this online program for studying and discussing uh, the great books of the Western world, and I'm sure that a number of my listeners are familiar with that concept, but for, for those who aren't, can you explain before we get into the details of, of your program, what are the great books? Yeah, the, the great books is something that some people call the Western canon, and it's not a list of books that a bunch of people sit down in a room and smoke cigars and, <laughs> you know, and argued what those books were. It's kind of a, it's an emergent list of important works that are influential in Western civilization. So, I say, when I say emergent, I mean, it's, it's sort of self-evident. The list proves itself. So, for example, if you read some Freud, you would see he mentioned Nietzsche. And then he said, gosh, I need to really understand what Freud's talking about. And you went and found Nietzsche. Then you would see that he, was, he would spoke about Hegel and Kant. Then you would read those guys and so on and so on. And you end up back at Homer. And so, these books are self-referential. They build on each other or maybe react to each other in some cases. And, and have influenced the way we think about the world around us. Okay, so basically it's, it's more of looking at what's already occurred, what, what has, the books that have already been deemed important by the figures in this conversation, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it, it, they are books that were important enough and the ideas in them were uh, significant enough that people continued to react to them in thoughtful ways. And who was the person who came up with this concept for an educational program? Well, probably John Erskine at Columbia University. He started trying to get a program like this instituted and kind of got interrupted by World War One, And then after World War One, created a great books program that's pretty much what we would recognize now for essentially men returning from World War One. The thing about it that was interesting or revolutionary was that the books were read in translation. Up until then, people were really pretty nasty purists about reading Homer in the Greek, you know, or reading Augustine in Latin, you know, or Aquinas in Latin. And he said, gosh, these guys are specialists. It's the 20th century and people are specialists and they spend so much time learning, you know, their craft, whatever that may be, uh, engineering or whatever, that they don't really have the time to go learn the Greek, you know? So he, he said, it's, it's worthwhile to read it as we can, as best we can, rather than to not read it at all. And he actually made a lot, a lot of um, opposition to that idea, actually. But he went out and he then had some students 
who went on to you know continue to grow the movement. He taught uh, Mortimer Adler, who then actually he didn't graduate from Columbia. He left. He left without graduating because they had they were going to make him do some PE, you know, physical education credits, and he he split. But he ended up at the University of Chicago and built the program further there. And then other students like Mark Van Doren, uh, Scott Buchanan, some other Stringfellow Bar, they ended up going and starting a, like St. John's College, which is still running today and runs a great books program. So, so that's what it looked like in universities for the kind of the first half of the 20th century. And then uh, eventually Adler cut a deal with Encyclopedia Britannica to sell a set of these great books of what he thought were the great books door to door because he wanted every household in the United States to have Plato and Aquinas and Aristotle sitting on their shelves. And, you know, he wanted this, wanted people to have a familiarity with those things. He thought our country would be a better place if more people knew those, the, the ideas contained in those books. And he became a huge, you know, he popularized the movement more than probably anyone else. So a lot of this, at least for Adler, this we alluded to this already, but these great books, the study of these great books is oriented around this this great conversation. So could you give an example of how that would f- follow through, perhaps even from from your program, how, how you would follow one sort of line of thought through multiple authors? Yeah, it's, so ph- philosophy really is a study that's focused on, you know, how do we live a good life? You know, how do we find the good life? There are a bunch of different components that, that we might need to think about uh, in that problem of, you know, how to live a good life. But one of those things might be ethics. You know, so, so Plato, well, before Plato, we have some examples of life written large, right? We have like the Odyssey and the Iliad. We've got these crazy Greek tragedies where people are put in these pressure cookers. You know, the, the Trojan War is a pressure cooker. You see, get to see the best and the worst of men. You know, there are these uh, Greek tragedies like Agamemnon in the Oresteia, where there are notions of justice being played out, you know, in these extreme situations that these people are thrown into. So we get to see how people act when the stakes are high in some of these earlier works. But then Plato starts to actually think about, you know, what is justice? You know, how do we act right? How do we do well to the other person and to ourselves? So he starts to, with using Socrates as his. I don't know his mouthpiece and his in his dialogues. He shows us how we might investigate some of those I, those ideas. And then Plato's student Aristotle picks that ball up and he says, "Ah, oh, we need to systematize this a little more. We we can, we now have some new tools. We've got some logic that we can apply to these things, and some geometry." And he actually uses a sort of geometrical argument for ethical behavior in his Nicomachean Ethics. Later on, Aquinas picks that up and he fuses that with a Christianity. And well, and we're still fighting about that stuff today. Uh, you know, uh, up through, you know, postmodernist thinkers are still handling that problem and maybe mishandling it. But but we we continue to con- you know try to carry that great conversation about you know what's the right way to act in order that we might have the good life. We just never stop talking about it. Now, obviously, the idea of the Western canon that has been controversial in recent decades in the academic sphere. Is, yeah. the, is the Western canon identical to the great books? Or if you talk about the great books or great books approach to education to, you know, your average literary professor, will he have a more positive reaction to that than to the phrase the Western canon? Or are they pretty much viewed in the same way? You know what? I really don't know. I, I, I really don't know how. I don't know how they would react to that. My suspicion, uh, my suspicion is that they would recognize that there are a set of books that are truly great and worthy of study, but that they might disagree with the great books method. And the great books method, if there is one, it's not really clear that there is, but if there is one, it's about shared inquiry and it's about aided discovery, right? So everybody can read these books. It's a very democratic thing. Everyone can read them. They are not for academics. They're not for specialists. It's for people who care. So if you care, you can read the book. And then the great books method people, normal people come together and they're led by someone who is an interlocutor. He's a, the, he or she's the host of the meeting and they try to act the, the role of Socrates. They try to ask questions to help each of the members of the group discover for themselves, you know, what they believe about the, the, the text, uh, what the text says, and what their reactions are to that text. And so, there's a shared inquiry model. There isn't anybody that gets up in front of the class and teaches. There are no notes. So, 
we are able to meet the books where we are and the books are there for us where we are as well. So the example I always give is that, you know, if you're 15 years old or even 13 years old and kind of a precocious kid, you can read the Iliad and you can really enjoy one of the, one of the best war action adventure stories ever told. But someone in their eighties who reads the Iliad will see messages about mortality, prosperity, you know, the, Hector's father loses all of his children in this. And, and so an older person, we get something much different from the book. But the point is, because we don't teach, because we don't lecture, everyone is free to get from the book what they need to get from it. And that's the opposite of the university experience nowadays, mostly. So at a great books, if you were going to go to a place like St. John's College, it would be much the same, right? Like, you, like I, in the online great books program that you run, it's you're very down on using secondary sources, for example. Is, is that pretty much the same in Great Books College? I believe so. I mean, I, I can't speak for all of them or, or actually any of them, but I, but I think so. And, and where we're, we're, you say we're down on using secondary sources, we don't want our readers to use a secondary source until they've been through the book once. Right, right. Our idea is that the secondary source will... You know, like I said, we want the reader to get from the book what they want to get from it. And we find that secondary sources will also often, they poison the well. You know, they point out things about the book that were important to the person who wrote the secondary source. And so, we're not able to have an authentic experience of the Iliad. We end up having a mediated experience of the Iliad. So, if anybody's interested in this sort of idea, there's, a, there's an essay by Walker Percy called The Loss of the Creature. And in that essay, he tells a story about the first person who saw the Grand Canyon. And he says that the first person that saw the Grand Canyon may be the only person who's ever really seen <laughs> it. Because after that, you know, well, if you go see the Grand Canyon today, you're going to take a specific road to the Grand Canyon. There's going to be, there are going to be signs. There's going to be handrails. It's a very mediated experience of what was originally, I'm making scare quotes here, the Grand Canyon. And and it changes the character of that experience. And secondary sources are much the same way. And so we believe that everyone can get from the thing what they need. It's not to say we wouldn't use a dictionary. It's not to say we wouldn't look at a map. We wouldn't look at a timeline to try to figure out, you know, where these things fall in the course of history. But we certainly don't want any sort of interpretive material in front of us until we get a chance to interpret ourselves. Because we trust that, you know, the serious people, the people who care about this, can interpret it for themselves the way they need to. Of course, that is the argument for reading in the original language as well. That's true. You know, we read a translation and arguably a translation is a secondary right. source. But, you know, look, what are you going to do? Not read the Iliad at all? You know, if you, if you don't even approach it through the best possible translation that you can and maybe get a Greek lexicon and hit some of the words that you're interested in or, or p cause problems for you in interpreting the thing, then we're definitely stuck with getting a mediated experience of it from, you know, remakes in the movies or the retellings of someone else. Right. So the translation is best as we can do with the limited time we have. We're all busy people. Yeah, that you know? makes sense. Okay, so let's let's get to this program. I've, actually, let's let's start with with you. What was your encounter with the great books? Oh gosh, I I, I had wrestled a number of these several times and not done very, not done very well. I remember I picked up a one of those Harvard Classics editions of the Republic at a garage sale or something when I was like maybe 14 or 15 years old. And I'd attempted to read that thing a couple of times and it just was, it was great to me. I didn't get anywhere. You know, I was a, I was a decent reader and I read, I read a lot, but it, I just, man, I just couldn't get anywhere with the thing. And I'd tried several other important texts over the years and kind of floundered. And then several years later, I decided to I had, had kids and we were going to homeschool the kids and I just wanted to find out how to best do that. And in looking into that for the kids, I realized, man, I've got some, I've got some problems here. You know, I have this science background and there are whole, whole arenas of thought that I hadn't really been exposed to, had no experience with. So I decided that I needed to fill those holes. And in looking on to how I may do that, I found the Great Books Program and I resolved to... So, I started a, a, a book group in my home. We've been meeting in my home now the third Thursday of each month for about four years. And after doing that for a while, one of the guys in my group, he's Brett McKay of Art of Manliness. He's like, gosh, Amber, you really need to start one of these online. And I did. And so, that that has become onlinegreatbooks.com. So, you're, you're not an academic. You don't have an academic background of any kind, really. Terrible student. Terrible student. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, C average maybe. 
So it's really interesting. What 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 have you been doing? Well, I mean, let's start here. You just sold a company that you had had for what twenty years. Uh, tell us about that. I mean, yeah. you you built this company and and you finally just decided to move on from that. I had a company called Data Storage in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You can still see the website. It's up. It's datastorageinc.com. And we were in the records management business. We were essentially like a commercial library for businesses. So we libraried oil and gas records, medical records, business records, blueprints, you know, you name it, for a thousand different companies. And we did that in both hard copy and digital. We did document digitization so we converted stuff from paper to, to digital. And we had about 65,000 square feet of warehouse. We stored hard copy in and we had terabytes and petabytes of, of digital storage. And December 28th, I sold that business. And then I'm just focusing now on running online great books and uh, uh, barbell coaching, <laughs> surprisingly. But yeah, I'm not an academic. You know, I've been a small business person, been in the sort of back office business world for 20 years. And I'm, I'm glad to be doing something different now and have some some novelty in my yeah, life. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, what about the barbell coaching? Now, that actually has a connection to this this program, right? Yeah, I, I'm a starting strength coach. Uh, starting strength is a method for teaching barbell, barbell lifting to novices. And it's a tough credential to get. There are about 125 of us. Their credential has been around for over 10 years. There are about 125 of these coaches. So, we're pretty well sought after and we get good results. And I started a podcast called Barbell Logic. I have a partner named Matt Reynolds who does that with me, comes out twice a week. We talk about, well, we talk about barbells, but over the, over the years, it's become sort of a, a, a li- about half lifestyle <laughs> stuff too. And we talk about books, we talk about small business, we talk about family, and we talk about just, you know, our habits and our lives, you know. And through talking about that kind of stuff, when I launched online great books, probably the first hundred or 150 members of it are all barbell people. So there, there are people all over the country like squatting real heavy at their gym and then reading Plato in between <laughs> sets. It's super weird. The people who do the barbell training and the people that that really read these books as a as an avocation, they share they share a lot of characteristics. They're about self improvement. They're about discipline and. And, and they're really about they're really about community too. Just just so happens that people who do barbell train love reading these books. People who do like jujitsu seem to love these books. You know, there's something about people who push themselves and have the discipline to do something miserable, <laughs> like like squat in the high threes or the low fours or whatever three times a week. Really like digging into books that get them over their head quick. Yeah, that that's one of the really fun and enticing things about this this program I think is the the sheer variety. I mean the sheer diversity of people who who are involved. I mean we hear about diversity constantly, but I mean it's not Yeah, they're just talking about what color the people are. They they all think the same way. They're just Yes, exactly. This is this is like actual you've got a prison guy. I remember in the group that I enrolled in. This this program's been around for what a year and a half now. About, yep. Yep. Okay, so I I enrolled back in August, and in the group that I enrolled with, there was uh, the the larger group that enrolled at the same time as me. There was I remember like a prison guard, a, a the guy who yeah. described himself as like the towel boy at a a car wash. Yep. You know, there's also people who teach at classical schools and and artists, and uh, there was a couple TV writers in there, and all these different types of people and all these you know all these weightlifting people and it's just like such a such a variety of perspectives and i i found that really valuable both in terms of the value that it brings to those people who you don't think of as necessarily being involved in an academic environment which this isn't and also to everybody else who's in the program because they're benefiting from that perspective and discussion I led a discussion on the Iliad early before you joined. And, you know, the Iliad is essentially about a war in the Middle East, you know, the Mediterranean at least. And we had an ER nurse in there in an Iraq vet. You know, it, it was heavy duty. You know, these people bring a whole variety of experiences to these to these texts and can they then can share the problems that they have with the texts. Mm. You know, because sometimes they, we just don't agree with them or we don't like something about them aesthetically or, or whatever. And, 
and they'll bring those complaints or the things that they loved about them and the things that they hate about the book and the thing that they love about the book is colored by their real experience. These are grown, mature people. These aren't high school seniors, although we have some high school mm-hmm. seniors. Man, and it'll wreck you. You know, having an ER nurse and an Iraq vet talking about the Iliad. I mean, you can imagine. Yeah, sure. We have another gentleman who's in his 80s that he doesn't say very much. But when he does, everybody stops because he's going to bring almost nine decades of, of life to bear on something important that one of these great people wrote. You know, you, I just don't know where the heck else you'd get that unless you were lucky enough to have a granddad right. or something that had read yeah. these things and wanted to sit down and talk to you yeah. about it. And that's that's Joseph. You know, I'm so glad all those people are there. Yeah, I can hear you getting emotional about it. Yeah. So, yeah, well, in my group, I, my seminar is, I think there's the most personal that we've gotten as far as somebody bringing their personal experience to bear on the discussion was one of that one of our guys is a farmer down in Southern Virginia, mm. which I didn't know until we were <laughs> discussing the Odyssey and, and talking about the terrain of Ithaca and what kind of animals it was good for <laughs> raising and what kind of animals no. it wasn't good for raising. And he was, you know, talking, and we were talking about the swine herd and the goat herd and, you know, what are the characteristics of these different animals and what might have been the associations that, you know, the Greeks had with them. And this guy was talking about about, you know, dealing with pigs and, you know, wrestling pigs and all that stuff. It was, and that's, that's it was fantastic. Great. And we've got an Episcopal priest in there who also plays trumpet and writes electronic music. We've got, we've got, <laughs> we've got two actors and, you know, a bunch of other great guys and a couple, a couple girls as well. There's, yeah, it, it seems to be mostly men in the program, but not that women aren't welcome. I, I wonder why that would be. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, probably part part of it is that, you know, I'm kind of the main marketing voice, you know. I can be I'm a, just a reformed redneck from Katusa, Oklahoma. <laughs> I can be a little rough sometimes, so I probably don't speak to uh, their needs maybe as much as I do uh, farmers from the Virginias or whatever, <laughs> right. whatever you know. Yeah. But we don't, we don't have an application process or anything like that. You know, if you've got a shipping address and your credit card runs, you're welcome to join, join us, you know. Yeah. So, I don't claim to know why they, why they don't. Sure. Why they don't yeah, no, I know that wasn't intended welcome. to be any kind of gotcha question like you would get on the, the sure. media or anything. It just sort of, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There seem to be a fair number of, you know, for our audience, there seem to be a fair number of Catholics on there. I, I don't, I mean, there's definitely people of all political stripes, but it does seem like, at least in today's environment, not necessarily in the 19th century or the early 20th century, in today's environment, it does seem like people of a more conservative or traditional bent are more likely to be interested in reading these books. Maybe they, they're less likely, or or maybe it's it's less that they're more interested in it and more that they're less likely to have been sort of inoculated against the idea of a canon in the first place. I don't know. What do you think? Well, there are certainly, you know, that problem that you just outlined, but I, I think more broadly, particularly in the, in the, in the, in the United States and maybe some parts of Europe, so we've kind of been infected with this positivism, like better living through science, mm. like this this idea that that we are just con- that that culture is continually improving, and that the newest iPhone is better than the last iPhone, right? And so, I mean, that I think that this whole that whole sort of attitude suffuses everything, and I think there are a lot of people who are just skeptical as to what a twenty four hundred year old book might have to tell you. You know, what shouldn't I read? nonfiction New York Times bestseller rather than, you know, the Republic, right. Plato's Republic. You know, I just think there's just, there's just a, I don't know, there's just a cult of the new, yeah you know, that's, you know, even if the people aren't ideologically opposed to an idea of the canon, it seems stodgy and out of date to a lot of right. people. But I'll tell you, you know, one of the biggest lessons for me in doing this for all these years now, I don't know, I've probably read 30,000 pages of this thing is that nothing has changed. <laughs> I think it's, um, oh gosh, I think it's the assembly women, Greek tragedy. I think that's the one. Uh, guy gets up in the morning and his, and he swings his feet out of the bed and his house shoes are missing. And he's like, oh gosh, my wife was have slipped them on to go take out the trash and she didn't put them back. <laughs> and the thing's like 2,000 years <laughs> wow. old. And I'm like, okay, okay, nothing's changed. Yeah, it's amazing. Nothing's changed. Yeah. And of course, you know, I mean, that's just one little example, but 
but a lot of people think things have changed. They think that you know that mankind has evolved, oh, yeah. and that our that our ethics are better, or that we have a deeper understanding of those things that might lead us toward the good life. Yeah, yeah, and so you know, why would they read Descartes? Yeah. Well, yeah, most people, I mean, even most well-read people, I mean, like, l- look at Jordan Peterson. I mean, the guy, he basically, I mean, he reads the Bible, but he reads it through a distinctly modern lens. And and also, you know, if you look at his great books, reading his his reading lists on, on his website, it's pretty much all modern. It's all 19th and 20th century. And most people who are even quite well-read just don't read something that's from a radically different worldview. Yeah, or you know, a different era. Yeah, he Peterson. I I think uh, in, uh, his his favorite book is probably, or his favorite books are probably the Solzhenitsyn books. Sure, would be yeah. my guess. I have interviewed him. There's an interview of him on I think it's episode five of the Online Great Books podcast. If everybody wanted to hear him talk about great books, and I think I think a close runner up to the Solzhenitsyn books are, is probably uh, the Divine Comedy for him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I don't think I've heard him talk about yeah. it that much. Yeah, he talked about it in, in that interview with me a little oh, bit. Oh, that's good. But he is, he is a, he, he's a modernist. He's a, and he probably is a positivist too, you know? he's. I mean, when it comes down to it, yeah. I mean, he talks about recovering these old things, but he even says, like, we can't believe in the same way we used to, and, it, and, it, and it's basically yep. has to be in sh- symbolic, you know, psychological terms. Yeah. You know, he's out there trying to get people to read serious works, even though they are, you know, some of them are newer, sure. maybe, or, or uh, so, you know, there's, there's this thing called the Lindy effect. Have you heard of the Lindy no. effect? It's a, uh, the idea is that the life expectancy of something, whether it's a piece of art or an idea or a book, the life expectancy of that thing is, pr- is roughly equal to how old it already is. So if you make a, 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 a Coca-Cola can, <laughs> And that thing takes, you know, three weeks to get from the factory to your mouth and you drink the Coca-Cola. It probably won't make it three more weeks. Hmm. But if it's a Ming vase from China that's already, you know, from the Ming dynasty and is already super old, people are going to treasure that thing and keep it around for a long time. So one of these books that has passed, you know, people like like Plato, people hand copied that thing by candlelight, sometimes against threat of death so that their grandkids could have it. And so that sort of winnowing effect, the pressure of time on the, these books with these big ideas, and it means that they're going to last, a, they're probably going to last a very, very long time in the future as well. So these newer books, we don't know if they're going to make the sure. canon. We don't know if they're going to take, or if they're going to, you know, survive that pressure and get through the funnel <laughs> of time. Uh, so the Lindy effect, if you, you know, the Lindy effect's pretty much. I don't know. It's a rule of thumb that I stand <laughs> that I stand by. You know, we already talked a little bit about I had this data storage business. So we were in not only kind of the information management business, but we were also in the knowledge management business. So information, we know what that is, but knowledge is a little crazier. In a business, it could be like, where do we keep the coffee pa- the copy paper? Like there's a, there's somebody in every office that knows where all the bodies are buried, they say. That person is the repository of the institutional knowledge. Hmm. In the, in the mid-60s, the half-life of knowledge was estimated to be about 18 years. So, if you knew something in 1965, chances are it would still be good. Half of it would still be good uh, 18 years later. And it's hard to estimate what the half-life of knowledge is, but we can make some attempts. And nowadays, half-life of knowledge is guessed to be around something like 18 months. So, an example might be like driving a, f- a standard transmission. There's nothing wrong about having the knowledge to do that, but it's probably it's probably becoming obsolete, right? There are certain programming languages that are still that that worked, but we don't use them anymore. That knowledge is obsolete, so we have to be very careful about the things that we learn, because there are a lot of the things that we can learn aren't going to be very valuable in a very short while. So I'm I try to be you know my mortality <laughs> has, has driven me to go go deeper and deeper with the books I read and all the media I consume. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I keep coming back to this. I live in New York City and on the subway they've got a program with the subway Wi Fi where you can get free read free ebooks on the subway and they've got ads for this Ooh. in the subway and they have sort of a you know a grid of examples of the books you can read and 
I think with the sole exception of the complete stories of Flannery O'Connor, every single one of those books listed is an identity politics book. Every single one of them is about feminism or, you know, intersectionality or like, you know, just some whatever the latest fad is and some of them i guess maybe some of them are about food or like something stupid but like you know what i mean like, just like some stupid right. best new bestseller like I, I i just aside from the ideological aspects which are obviously there it's just depressing to think that like these are all like books that have been released they all look like they've been b- released maybe they have de beauvoir on there or something but they, they all look like they're pretty much from the Ooh. past decade and a half you know mm-hmm. and that's it's very sad because this is like a public presumably they think they're contributing to the good of the general public by instituting this program but like Pre- presumably yeah and i'm sure they have i hope they actually have some old books on there but what they're advertising maybe just to get people to do it is to is all these new ones and and they're and they're all heavily ideological you can just tell from the covers and the titles mm-hmm I don't know. I just wanted to rant about that for a second, <laughs> but it's always annoying to me when I when I see that because it's like, well, what's the what's even the point of reading? You can get all that in a in an op ed in the New York Times, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the, you know, publishing business is an odd thing. You know, a lot of these, well, I mean, virtually all these books that we read are out of copyright. You know, Plato's successors aren't <laughs> are gathering up a bunch of royalties, you know, and so the, the like the com- the commercial the commercial interests and protections that someone might have if they put out the new Daniel Pinker book uh, just aren't there for, you know, you know, one Who's of these Daniel books Pinker? That, you know, Shakespeare. Shakespeare. <laughs> you don't know Daniel Pinker? Good. You mean Stephen Pinker? Oh, Stephen Pink- Pinker. And then Daniel Dennett? The one. Daniel, Daniel Dennett. Okay. Yeah, I was just I, curious. I, I made, I, uh, <laughs> that's how important they yeah. are to me. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the, the commercial interest in, you know, putting out one of those books that are, you know, protected by copyrights in every, in every way you turn versus putting out another edition of a Shakespeare, of Shakespeare just isn't there, you know. So, like intellectual property laws, I think, kind of make it less profitable to put out some of these books. And if the profit's not there, the advertising's not there. If the advertising's not there, they can't get the, the uh, New York City Transit Authority or whatever to put them on their deal, you know, it, on and on. And, and that's if I don't put my tinfoil hat on and I could put that on and sure, go crazy sure. with, <laughs> with it. Yeah. But yeah, we're kind of behind the eight ball. Like, you know, there's a cult of the new. Yep. So yeah. in this program, the, the Bible is definitely part of that, that great books, that list of great books. It's at the very beginning with the Iliad yes. and the Odyssey, but you don't read the Bible in this program. And I don't want to get too much into that because it could be discussed forever. Oh, I, I just want to, I just want to note it. I mean, you don't even have to say anything if you don't want to. I just want to note it that basically the idea is like people are not probably going to be prepared to discuss this in the, in the sort of disinterested and rational spirit of the program. And also, as you've pointed out, there is, plenty of Bible study groups available all over the country, all over the world, whereas it's harder to find, you know, a good group of guys to read the Iliad with or whatever. So I just wanted to note that. But Yeah, that's important. We don't cover that in our program and for the reasons that you said. And then and then also, you know, there are about I I, I've recently read that there are like forty thousand denominations now. And so almost any almost any I don't know interpretation of any of any piece of the Bible will put you firmly in one of those forty thousand camps, you know. And like we we couldn't think that of any way that we would treat it that wouldn't get us in hot water with someone. <laughs> I think that everyone I think everybody should wrestle it and and spend time with it. But we just couldn't find a good way for ourselves to do it in. It, you know, and, and then it's online too. You know, all of our discussions are online and there's something about not being in the same room with people that makes it a little easier to get vituperative, yeah. you know, and we want to, we want to avoid that. One of my biggest fears is that somebody will be hurt by something that we do. Sure. Here. And uh, boy, that seemed like a real fast way to right. do it. Yeah. No, it's understandable. I should mention to you, it is, it's so the, the way these discussions work, they're online, but they're using video conferencing. They use Zoom, yeah. basically. And if anybody's familiar with that, that's a video conferencing software. And so you are typically seeing people's faces. But like you said, you're not in the same room with them. You're in no physical peril. Yeah, that's that's true. 
But the reason I actually the main reason I brought up the Bible is to mention you know we are reading some re- Christian and religious works of various kinds, various points of view, and this program is relatively young, so I don't think we, we've nobody, not even the earliest people who enrolled, haven't gotten through the Greeks yet. But I'm just sort of curious how people are going to respond because okay, so the Iliad and the Odyssey, obviously Homer has a very different worldview than the modern worldview, but it doesn't seem as much of like a threat. I think to people because it's it's not so current as anything mm-hmm. like Christian is. So I, I'm I'm sort of curious to see how people are going to respond to say Augustine or whatever. Not that there's anything like super inflammatory in there necessarily, but I I just I wonder maybe from your own experience from the group the great books group you're involved with where you guys meet in person are. Are there anybody, is there like a wide divergence of points of view in that group? Have you gotten a sense of how people who aren't used to, inter, you know, dealing with these ideas, who maybe aren't religious, how they approach those texts? Yeah, we've got eight or 10 guys in the group. I think 10. We've got Mormons, Catholics, Protestants, atheists, neither here nor theirs. We're all in there. And uh, our youngest guy, I think is 20. Two and our oldest one's sixty-eight. Yeah, and you, you know Augustine. Uh, everybody enjoys Augustine. You know, you read the you read his Confessions, and it's a fantastic autobiography. It has, you know, it has theological implications. It has implications for ethical behavior, whether you're, you know, to coming at it from a Christian angle or not. It has a, it has ethical uh, component to the thing, and everybody seems to enjoy that. We got to, you know, you get to um, the city of God, and there's a uh, there's a historical component there that people enjoy. People enjoy Augustine. He's kind of a he's like your crust, he's like a your crusty neighbor. He's super grumpy, <laughs> and, and 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 he makes some jokes. People enjoy him. Same thing with Aquinas. It's not that he's funny. He's not, but the proofs are beautiful. Um, his writing style is so so good. You know, where he, where he, he poses the question and, and, the, and the the reply and then the opposition, you know, and the counters all and the practice things. of uh, what my one of my favorite economists, Bob Murphy, uh, he probably didn't invent this, but he calls steel manning. Yes, where you yeah, where you present a right. better argument for your on behalf of your opponents than they did themselves, and then and then debunk it. Yep, that's right. It, that's Daniel Dennett's word. By oh, the way, oh yeah, okay, interesting. Well, okay, well yeah. he contributed <laughs> yeah. something. Yeah, there we go. That's right. Yeah. So people, they enjoy that. You know, we, we're right now we're reading uh, Dante and I got, you know, I got an engineer guy in my group and he's like, man, this is just reading somebody's crazy fever dream. Hmm. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we have all sorts of reactions and, and, and nobody loves all the books in the darn, in the, in any of these lists, you know, whether it's, it's the list that you and I are reading here at online great books or University of Chicago list or whatever, nobody loves them all. But we, we try to go into it as a good faith reader. You know, we try to go into these books believing that they have something important to say, that there's something in it that we can get from it. And, uh, you know, we, well, we approach it in good faith. And sometimes it's tough. You know, well, like I said, the Dante has been difficult for some of our, our the, the gents in my group. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it because it's hell or, I mean, is that basically it or? I mean, hell, it's a it's a crazy book, man. Sure. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, the the punishments punishments meted out, the the whole geography of the thing. You know, they go down, they go back up, they come out the other side of the mountain the, of the earth. You know, I mean, it's the whole thing is an honest reading of the book can come to the conclusion that the whole darn thing's fanciful. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is one honest reading of the book. And then another one is that maybe it's a, a fusion of Aquinas with like, you know, sort of Christian mythology, maybe. Mm. Right. And, I mean, there, there, there are all kinds of ways. Well, obviously, the there's thing. fanciful elements of it, you know. Oh, yeah. sure. R- yeah. r- regardless of where you stand. And then, you know, I've got a guy that went to law school in our group, you know, and we were talking about implications for jurisprudence what, when you read this thing. Because... You know, they're all different levels of crimes and sins and mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, that are that are being dealt with by Dante when he puts these people in these different levels of hell or purgatory. And uh, that has consequences if you think about jurisprudence. Oh, interesting. You know, if somebody steals a whole bank full of money versus shoplifts some bubble gum, you know, <laughs> what, what do we do to that? Right. Like, what, you know, what's the just way to deal with that? And, and, 
and Dante puts forth what he thinks might be a just way to deal with all these different sins of crimes. It's pretty sure. interesting. So there's all kinds of ways to come at it. And, and, you know, if you have a skilled seminar host and you've got a whole sack of cats that are getting ready to discuss the, the divine comedy, you, know, you can kind of steer them into some of these different, more dispassionate ways to discuss the book sure. and, and, have, and have a darn good session of it. Well, that's what we try to do every single right. time. Well, maybe we should get into the details of the, the how this program, Online Great Books, actually works. So, I mean, just start starting out with, you know, how do you actually structure the reading? Hmm. Yeah, so this is more about, more about how the barbell training played into this. I'm a starting strength coach, and the novice program that we put weightlifters on is called Linear Progression. And a, a novice weightlifter can put a little more weight on the bar every time they come in to the gym and squat, for example, for many, many, many weeks. And if you graph the weight on the bar from left to right, it makes, you know, it's a linear function and it just goes up, you know, at X plus five pounds every t single time they come in. And we call that linear progression. And eventually that sort of table, that kind of plateaus as you reach your sort of get close to your genetic potential. But for a while you can do this linear thing. And I, I told you earlier, I had tried to read The Republic and Descartes and some other things that didn't do very well. When I found this program, we started off by reading some Plato, and boy, we didn't do very well, my home group. And we ended up backing up and reading How to Read a Book, and then we read The Iliad, and then we read How, the how to Read a Book is by Mortimer Adler, for people who... Yes, yeah. Mortimer J. Adler's How to Read a Book, because we found out we didn't know how to read. We were all taught <laughs> how to read in like the 70s and 80s, which was all skimming and scanning right? Getting the bullet points, reading the headline, fast, 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 just information acquisition. And we didn't know how to do careful reading of important material. So we went, I found how to read a book and we all read that and it changed us. And then when we went back through the books in chronological order, we got to follow this great conversation from the very beginning. So we were in on all of it as opposed to jumping in the middle and not catching the references, not understanding the foundation that, the, that Aristotle standing on, for example. So, when I started online great books, we actually called it intellectual linear progression because we progressed through this thing chronologically in a linear way, as opposed to maybe reading all of the works on justice first. You know, maybe reading Euthyphro and maybe in Plato and then whatever. But so we don't we go through the things linearly in chronological order. So the first book we read is how to read a book. The second one we read is the Iliad, the Odyssey. Uh, then we move into the place of Aeschylus. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. What kind of pace are you reading at? Yeah, we read. We read. We set, we have set this thing up so that the normal, an average reader, is going to be able to get their stuff done in three hours a week. So some weeks we read a lot. We might read something that's light. Well, Purgatorio, Dante, for example, is pretty fast reading. It's there's a lot of meat in there, but there aren't a lot of technical terms. It's fine. So you might read a lot. And other days. Other times we're going to read some uh, Plato and it's heavy lifting and it might be a 10 or 12 to 12 page week. The point though, is that it's geared for busy people and that we just ask for, we just ask for 30 minutes a day, six days a week and we'll get it, we'll get you, we'll get you done. And uh, then there's the seminar once a month and that's like a two hour thing that's with right. your group. And how many people are on average are in each group? There are about 20 in a group and they all, we all meet online and in the evening, we, most of the seminars start at 7 p.m. on uh, Central Time. We have a couple of afternoon seminars, and, but most of them are at 7 p.m. Central, meet for two hours. We have an interlocutor in there, a seminar host who is there to ask you the tough questions, keep the conversation on the texts. You know, if people start getting <laughs> start getting mad at Dante, maybe zig where you were zagging. You know, if people are getting irritated with the Dante book, you know, can kind of move it maybe into that discussion about the consequences for jurisprudence, for example. Mm. Like I just that example I gave, you know, to to make sure that the conversation goes where it needs to go, not for the host, not for my program, but for that group. Make sure the thing goes where it needs to go, and to keep the conversation alive. And then, you know, so we send reading reminders out via text and email. We've got some check-ins that people can do online. So I, I say that people come for the accountability, but then they ended up staying because the seminars are so darn interesting and so helpful. One of our seminar hosts is Emmett Penny, and he's a St. John's graduate, a Johnny. 
And at St. John's, he told me, I didn't go to St. John's, but he told me that at St. John's, they say that the close reading of the text is actually done in the seminar. And I think that's yeah, that true. That makes sense. Yeah. I've certainly gotten whatever, you know, special insights I've gotten so far have been during the seminar, typically. That's partially because I haven't managed to organize my time well enough to read through the things a second time, you know, by myself. But mm -hmm. But the seminar is definitely a place where you, the connections get made, and it's it's very exciting. Yeah, you know, I, I've told this story on different podcasts. One of our members is Elizabeth, and she's in group number seven. Elizabeth always sees something that I didn't see. You know, early on, she she said that she told me she hated the Iliad. <laughs> and I'm like, why do you why do you hate the Iliad? And she says, oh, it glorifies war. You know, and I well, I didn't see that. She's not wrong. I mean, to me, it's just a cautionary tale. You know, everybody dies. It's just gruesome. It's horrible. But to her, she said, no, no, it glorifies war. You know, it portrays these men as these grand, these grand, giant, bigger than life characters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, heck, she's right. I'm right, too. Actually, I think it is. I think it's both. I like to think about the Iliad. It's, it's, it's basically saving the first 40 minutes of saving Private Ryan. You know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an amphibious landing. It's super bloody. Most of the people that are in it don't really know what it's about. And it's both and it's both cautionary and it's glorious as well. Is there well, actually, you know what, I'm gonna to get to that question later if we have time. You've got so we're reading through the whole canon, basically Adler's list or a version of one of Adler's lists with some slight changes. Yeah. So there are but you're developing a number of special programs sort of adjacent to the main reading program. So can you tell us about some of those? Yeah. Well, when we first put together our list, we left out a, quite a bit of stuff. Actually, we left out most of the science and math in there. And I didn't really want to, but we didn't know how to do it online. We didn't really know how to do it the way we would be able to do a discussion. So, well, we left it out. But uh, since then, we've we've kind of figured out how to do Euclid, the elements. Uh, so we're going to we've added a program where if you're a member, you can jump in there. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Well, no, actually, that's not true. We, try, we have a little materials fee. It's like sixteen dollars to send you your text and a little whiteboard. And we work through the first forty seven proofs in Euclid's elements. We start from his very beginning definitions and get all the way through proving the Pythagorean theorem. And you know, Emmett. Again, Emmett Penny, he said, man, you know, we really need to get this in because Aristotle use, uses Euclid to define his politics and his ethics. And, you know, reading those things without having Euclid just isn't the same. So, by, you know, we added that. We also, we also wanted to improve. We also found that we wanted to imp improve people's confidence in their ability to do dialectic, to do this this discussion that we do in these seminars. So we put together a thing we call the, the uh, Socratic crash course where people go in there. We go for five weeks and read a number of essays and with, with the idea that we are, we, that we're going to improve our ability to do discourse with our, our fellow seminar members and hopefully our family and people around us too. So we, we have been a study in dialectic, you know, the using discussion to, to you know, find some to prove some truth claims. So our hope there is we'll, you know, improve a few members' abilities to to do that, and and thereby you know improve the quality of the discourse in all the seminars. We we have a reading course that will be opening. Actually, we'll be opening that to the public probably the first part of February. I've talked to a lot of people who joined our waiting list to 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 become members, but then didn't sign up. I've actually called and talked to a lot of those people. And number one, they say it's too expensive. I can't help them there. Number two, they don't have time. Well, that's maybe not true. So we're trying to work on that as well. But three, a lot of people think they can't do it. There are a lot of people that were excited when they were in the 10th grade and they read Hamlet. I mean, and, and they wrote their paper and they turned it in. And Mrs. Jenkins gave them a C. Hmm. You know, I don't know how you can give somebody a C on their Hamlet paper. I mean, I, you know what I mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And so, next thing you know, this guy or gal is 38 years old and they don't think they're up to it. Right. And it's, and it's just not true. So, our friend Marsha Enright, 
has written a course. She's a psychologist and she's actually created a course that we're going to be starting to offer to help people build their confidence in their reading skills, to actually give them some, you know, kind of nuts and bolts tips and tricks to improve their reading comprehension. But it's mostly about building their confidence. So we'll give them some little snippets of some difficult material and show up, teach them how to parse through it and show them that they can do it. That'll be coming out soon. And then our uh, Maliki Wall, she's one of our seminar hosts, and a longtime copywriter and ad man and rhetorician, has a writing course that we'll be putting out very, very soon. Oh, nice. Because we, we, we want people to use the trivium, the grammar, logic, rhetoric. And we, we're weak on the rhetoric part. The rhetoric part is when you write or speak beautifully or convincingly. And we try to get as much of that in the seminar as we can, but often there's not time for everyone to get, get their reps in, you know, to, to develop those rhetorical sure. skills. So we're hoping to add to that with, with Maliki's Socratic scribblings class is what he's calling it. And he takes, he takes lessons from Aristotle's rhetoric and poetics and other works in the great books to, you know, to show people how to speak and write beautifully and convincingly. Yeah, that's not a very common thing to be taught nowadays. I mean, it used to be, like you say, a basic staple of liberal arts education, but they don't teach it rhetoric per se anymore. I mean, it gets taught, you know, accidentally to a certain extent, but... Well, the, the word has been co-opted and poisoned right. to the point that people think that rhetoric means tricky BS, but that's not true. Like, we can say things that are very, very true, but use rhetoric to make people more receptive, to make that truth something more receivable by people that we care about. You know, it's not just about manipulating someone else into giving us their money or finding someone guilty, you know, in a jury or something like that. It's actually, it's actually much more practical than that. So how much does it cost to enroll in the main program and what does that cover? Well, it is $59 a month. If you, if you go and sign up and use the promo code Catholic culture, you get 25% off that for three months, but it's $59 a month and you get all of your books and all of the, um, the reading reminders and all the accountability stuff, the, the online Slack community. We, I don't know about 25,000 posts a month in there where people are talking in there all the time about all these different books and in their own seminar groups and the two hour seminar that's once a month which is really kind of the, the capstone of the whole thing, the most important piece, really. And, and then those courses, too. Those courses, too. And I'll, I'll tell you that the, I don't want to mislead anybody. Those courses, there is more demand among our members for those courses than we can meet. Like you were interested in the geometry one and, you made, <laughs> and it sold out in eight right. minutes when we announced it. You didn't get in. So there are a lot of people that didn't. Right. But over time, they will. And we will increase our capacity for these little special courses. We have one in logic coming too, probably, oh, cool. probably in the fall. But Aristotle's logic is being – his logical works are being read in the main thing, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. But we're going to give a little larger overview of, of logic. And then, then you would find in just like you know prior or post sure, analytics, sure. It, and, and you know it's useful to hit uh, that logic stuff before we get to Aristotle too. So that'll mm. be coming, you know, fall, early fall. So when yeah. does enrollment start? Well, we'll be enro- we we're opening on January twenty eighth, and we'll be open for about seven days or or two hundred fifty members, whichever comes first, and then we'll close it again, and we'll do it. We'll do it probably right after tax season is over. We'll do it about four times a year. If for some reason you go to the website and enrollment isn't open, you can click join now and you join our VIP waiting list. And then you'll get, you'll get first shot shot at it next time it opens. And we also send you all kinds of goodies. If you join the VIP waiting list, we send you all kinds of white papers and other goodies that might be useful to you if you wanted to start your own group or something. So that's onlinegreatbooks.com. And this uh, this episode is coming out on the 29th. You better hurry. Yeah. So it'll be, it'll ha- have already, been, enrollment will already have been open for a day. Do you have any uh, any more time to talk? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. I was just wondering for you personally in the course of this, this great book study, is there a book or an aspect of a book or a line of thought that has sort of changed you in a significant way the way you live the way you think about things yeah for sure certainly the republic is just it's too it's too good it contains too much i've probably read it five or six times now 
at the online great book staff has actually been doing seminars over the republic we're trying to have seminars among the staff people before we actually do seminars with the the members and uh oh uh, we went and we've been talking about that book and there's just so much there I, even though i've read it five times i probably have eight percent of that book you know i probably don't really own that much more of it in, in my head but um um it has changed my politics for sure um and uh well it, it has it has it is in, in you know in, in kind of everything so classically you had you know, so there's epistemology and metaphysics and then from your so epistemology is how we form concepts in our idea in our heads so um people clearly well actually there's some people that would debate debate this but to me it's clear that people do form concepts but you know how we form those is debatable people really aren't sure how we know something um so that's the epistemology and the metaphysics is like what can be known um and then you take your epistemology and metaphysics and you can build on top of that and you can come up with a, okay, we, we know some things. We know what we know. Well how, well, how does that tell us how we should act? Well, that would be ethics. And then how do we interact with the other? That would be politics. And then, you know, how do we do things beautifully? And, you know, that would be aesthetics. And um, Plato and Aristotle n never stop influencing those things for me and almost all areas of human action fall under those those headings i mean i, I say almost all i think they all do i don't know what else there would sure. be do you mind giving a really specific example of some an area where your thinking has changed or you've changed your behavior from having studied uh, one of these readings well the idea that you know understanding that nothing has changed <laughs> Changes so everything. Made you less of a modern, but yeah, but maybe it certainly makes you less of a. It makes me has made me less of a utopian. Hmm. Like you know, I mean, I think that there's something immutable and tangible about people. There's something about people that you can point to that doesn't seem to change. And as long as that's the case, until our prefrontal cortex gets bigger and our adrenals are smaller, and you know, some other stuff happens, you know, we we are we are in the lot we are in, and. You know, utopia is just not going to happen. You know, people have been writing and striving for utopias since we've written and striven. So, coming to that conclusion, you know, changes my pol has changed my politics. For example, it has consequences for child rearing. Has co consequences for you know how you enter into contracts with people. Mm. Uh, it has consequences for everything. And then, you know, every time I read Socrates. He just disabuses me of the idea that I really knew anything. I mean, he'll he'll make you a little little more uh, humble than you were when you started, probably. And if you weren't, if you didn't come out of uh, reading him a little poorer, <laughs> you probably didn't read him right. Would be my guess. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that thing about utopia and just realizing there is such a thing as human nature that's a constant, that's no small thing, especially these days. Yeah, you know, we're, we're taught that, you know, there's going to be better living through science, there's going to be a pill, that our, our ethics are evolving, that, that the human condition is improved. And while, you know, I sure do like my penicillin and, you know, some, some, some of that kind of stuff, we still get our hearts broken and we still hurt each other and we still have difficulty living close to each other and there's no magic there's no magic pill it's not going to get better how do you see online great books in the context of today's educational environment and feel free to rant <laughs> in our little socratic crash course we read this we read a little essay by um uh, oh my gosh i just forgot his name it'll come to me as i'm speaking here it's called it's about andragogy you know, traditionally, we, people have talked about pedagogy, and it shares a root with like the uh, the the pediatrician. It's like the teaching of children, instructing children, and so most teaching theory was surrounded around the idea. You know, how do you help kids? And so the 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 andragogy idea uh, that's Malcolm Knowles. It just came to me, is that you know adults learn in a different way, and you know he says that adults bring their own experience to the model, to the, the knowledge in front of them, to the subject matter. They bring their own experience and they learn for their own need. 
right? They, 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 they want to learn these things either to improve their relationships, to improve their business life, you know, whatever. But they, they do it for their, they're not credentialists. They're not trying to get a diploma or a grade necessarily. And I actually think that even children are the same way. I think that the androgogy thing, I think that's even uh, barking up the wrong tree. I actually think that's the way children are. I remember being in, in pre-algebra asking, you know, how am I going to use this? Like, you know, kids are keenly aware of what things are going to be of utility to them and what they what isn't as well. So, I mean, we are we are certainly a reaction to traditional pedagogy in the United States. We don't teach. We believe in aided discovery. New knowledge has appeared from time to time, like Newton's calculus or Leibniz's calculus or whoever you want to say. And those people discovered it. You know, they brought the they brought their consciousness to bear on information before them that was, you know, that came in through their senses and found new knowledge. And we believe that the best way for people to learn about those things is just to rediscover those things themselves. So we use these texts and use each other to aid each other in this discovery process. So we're trying, we're trying to help each other, each person teach themselves. And then hopefully in doing that, you can use those skills to learn anything that, to master anything you want to. And so, I mean, that, that ain't what grades K through 16 are or 18 anymore. You know, so that's, that's quite different. We offer no credential. If there was a credential that we could apply for, I wouldn't offer it. I want people to do this because they want to and because they need to. You know, so, I mean, all that's in direct <laughs> opposition to what's going on in colleges. Uh, and then, and then you know, the idea, you know, I spoke earlier about the half-life of knowledge and the sort of Lindy effect means that we don't really want to spend any time on something that's going to go away quickly. And, and it's not that people shouldn't learn programming languages or things that come and go, but that's not what we're going to focus on. We believe that people can specialize on, in those things on their own. Clearly, they do. Clearly, they do. There are people that have very specific, sure. interesting, novel sets of knowledge that other people don't have. And so, we just, we just go for the bones of the thing, the foundations, and then help people rediscover those things on their own. In fact, when we do this Euclid thing, we're going to all have to derive, do all the proofs ourselves. Like We're going to do it right along with the guy. So, hopefully, when you get to the Pythagorean, Patui, the Pythagorean theorem, the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You won't have just memorized it like you did when you were in high school. You'll actually know what the heck that means and how we got right. there. Yeah. That's the aided discovery part. And when you find something through aided discovery, well, if you find it through discovery, you know it better than anyone. But then if you find it through aided discovery, you have a depth of understanding of things that you don't have if you get it from lecture notes. Yeah, and especially when yeah. you consider how important these th uh, geometry and numbers were to the philosophical understanding of reality to ancient thinkers and medieval thinkers, probably even Renaissance thinkers, I think learning to do those proofs rather than memorizing them will help you to have a deeper understanding of that as well. You bet. And then you can use that you can use that, you know, stepwise rational approach to problem solving. You know, when you're going to go build a new home or right. something, it's not just the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. So, you know, I've had some conversations, uh, some, some universities have contacted me and wanted, I actually had a couple of them that wanted to hire me as a consultant because they're interested in what we're doing and I can't help them. Our job is to get more people to read these books and to understand these books and their job, they have two jobs. One is to, to they have to reform their institution in order to get people to do the one job we have. Right. So they're behind. But the they also have to get through. people, you know, into careers and, you know, all this stuff that all these expectations that have been, I don't know. Do they? Well, I'm just saying they think they do, but they, right. But that's part of the reform right, exactly. thing. You know, do, is that really what they need to do? Then maybe, you know, maybe it is. I don't know. I won't even presume to tell them, but you know, that's how, that's how we're different. You know, we already have people that mostly have careers that they want, but they want something else. Right. It's life isn't just about what you career. Right. It's not just. And so they want something sure. else. And we, we're trying to we're trying to help them find that other thing. They it want. seems as though the quest for universal education has basically destroyed <laughs> what education is. It's possible mm -hmm. that there's a way to do it that doesn't. 
certainly there's more opportunities for people to be educated than there ever were before. And yet they're the people who are educated are less educated than the educated people who came before. So, well, the problem is what's education. Right. Yeah. That's what Socrates would do. Oh yeah. What's education first. Let's talk about that. There's a Albert J. Nock wrote this book called um, memoirs of a superfluous man. And he had a great books education. He was really stodgy. He's one of those guys that thinks you need to read Homer in the Greek or you're camping out, you know, but he says, he says that we've conflated training with education. And, you know, training has a place, you know, and training somewhere you learn how to file or you learn how to saw a board or do bookkeeping, but it's not education. Sure. But even that is better than ideological training, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, some people would say that what we do here results in ideological training, but I think that's a happy coincidence. It's certainly not the goal, I think, you know, but you know, most of what, most of what modern uh, schools do is provide training actually. And, uh, which is, which is much different than what, what I would call education. Sure. We home we homeschool our kids. Although I don't like to say homeschool, we try to home educate schools are, you know, fish hang out in schools. <laughs> schools are weird. Schools are weird. Schools are where you learn to stand in line and sit down when they ring the bell and then stand back up when they ring the bell again. You know, schools are schools. Schooling is a much different thing than education. Sure. And uh, I'm not that interested in schooling, although I did get a bunch of it. I ate when they rang the bell and I stopped eating when they rang the bell. <laughs> yeah. I hear you channeling the late uh, John Taylor Gatto there. Yep. Yep. You know, he died. Uh, he died late last year, 2018. I woke up and saw it on Twitter and I just cried and cried and cried. He's a, a giant. Yeah. He was a great help to the homeschooling movement, but. Not just that, just uh, recalibrating people's idea of education and what the actual <laughs> goals of, you know, compulsory yep. education in America were. So, if any of you guys are interested in this, go go get it. The Underground History of American Education by John Taylor Gatto. He was the New York State School Teacher of the Year for two years in a row. And the last year he won it, he resigned in an open letter in the Wall Street Journal. He said he couldn't do it anymore. Because it was disgusting, essentially. Yeah, he said, I can't hurt children for a living anymore. And he was an award, yeah. a multiple year award winning uh, New York City, inner city school teacher. Yeah. Yeah, he's a fantastic individual and the world's a better place for him. You know? Yeah, for sure. He was a big influence on me doing this, for sure. Have you run across the C.S. Lewis quote where he basically says he has the suspicion that, you know, you're either going to have societies with very few your your only choices between societies between with very few free and educated people and societies with none. Right. H have you run across that? I haven't. I haven't. But that's <laughs> that's the Albert J. Knox premise. Right. He's a super uh, cynical guy who says almost everyone's trainable but few are educable. Right. I don't know if that's true. I, I think it's. I think it is actually fairly clear that there are some people that aren't educable. Uh, you can imagine there are people that are so handicapped and impaired, you know, cognitively impaired, they can't necessarily do the same things everyone else does. But, and then there are people that just constant, uh, just, they just don't want to, you know, they don't want to read Plato. They don't want to learn grammar. You know, there are people that don't want to, they're just constitutionally aren't interested. You know, it's not who they, not who they care to be. And, 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 you know, how, how, how would you compulsorily educate somebody who doesn't want to do it? And I didn't want to do it for a long time, you know, and it was K through 12. It was all I could do to not start a riot every day. And their job was to, you know, to educate me somehow. So whether everyone can be or not to get everyone, you know, functionally there is, gosh, it's a Herculean task. You know, I don't know if it can be sure, done. Yeah. Have you been in touch with any other people involved in online education? I mean, do, do you have a sense of where this is going, you know, in the next 20 years or so? I mean, online education in general. You know, I really haven't talked to anyone else that does does this kind of thing. You know, I've been watching this sort of MOOC plus space, you know, these massive online courses. Uh, and, you know, there are, there, are, there are big name brand universities that provide these free MOOCs, these massive online courses. Um you know, MIT and Harvard and some of these, you know, big name schools provide these, their coursework for free and you can go do that stuff for free. And, um, 
I don't think anybody, I don't think they're getting any bigger numbers into any one of any, what of their classes than we are. Hmm. Um, I think that, I think that, um, there is something about university. There, there's a value there in the people that are there. You know, the, the arguments that you would have in your dorm room with people, you know, uh, you know, about the book that you read or whatever class or whatever that you guys were all taking and stuff. There's something very, very valuable about that. And, you, and a lot of these MOOCs, you don't get that. And, you know, we, we do, we do provide a great deal of that. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it's headed. Um, I, I really don't. Yeah. Well, like you said, you're definitely not trying to give people credentials, so it might be a little bit perpendicular to some of the other things that are going on in online education. Yeah. I, you know, there are so many credentials. I mean, and I've got this starting strength coaching credential, but what does that mean to anyone? I mean, to people who know what it is, it means something, but to most people, it doesn't mean anything. And I think a lot of credentials are the same way. And then employment is changing. You know, there are a few people, there are fewer and fewer people are working for, you know, the same company for very long. We're, you know, kind of a society of perpetual job hunters. And I mean, just everything is in flux. And I think, you know, more and more people are, are in this kind of gig economy where they're working, you know, as a contractor and doing this working from home kind of stuff. And I think credentials. I think credentials are actually probably declining in value, even though they're proliferating. I mean, that, right. that, that was a supply. That makes thing. sense. So, so I think that you know, actually having a toolbox of skills that you can bring to bear, you know, rhetoric, you can convince the person of your ability to do the work. I mean, what's going to be better, a diploma or your ability to actually convince the other person that you can do the work? I don't know. I bet I would bet on the person that can speak convincingly versus the, you know, tongue tied weirdo with the good credential. Right. But I don't really know where this is going. I really don't. But I do think the bricks, bricks and mortar schools are in bad, bad trouble. And I think there'll be half as many in 30 years as there is now, or at least maybe not half as many, but there'll be ha half as, half as many square feet under, huh. <laughs> under university roofs as there are. Interesting. Now. They're pricing themselves out of the market and, and they're not in the, and so many of the schools are not delivering on the, unspoken promise of employment afterwards. Right, right. And I don't know how they're going to, I don't know, I don't know how young people can continue to pay for it when it costs more and delivers less. Sure, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, any other business, you know, if, if, I mean, when, when, when this, when this happened to Sears, everybody understood it, but because it's a state you, people don't <laughs> seem to get it. Right. How many people are enrolled in ODB now? There's about 400 right now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and so we should, you know, we'll add well, my gosh, we'll probably grow by around 50% here by the first or the second Friday of February. So where, where have you been getting your seminar hosts? A lot of them have been acquaintances of mine or, or acquaintances of our other hosts, of the hosts we have. And we've got some St. John's graduates. We've got a couple of philosophy PhDs. We've got some regular dudes. We've got a, an engineer. We've got a draftsman. We've got, we just had, uh, we just added one, Tina, who's a, uh, she's been in the marketing world and she's a, a member so we found her among the members. So one of the goals we have with the Socratic crash course thing, where we're trying to help people improve their ability to do this dialectic is to identify some people that can host seminars for sure, us. Yeah. Because we're not teaching, what we really need are people that can ask good questions and do this shared inquiry thing with our members and do that with humor and empathy and, and curiosity. You know, So we're, we're starting to, now we have enough members that have read enough of this you know, that they are 10 books past the Iliad that they can start to help other people work in the Iliad. Right. So we hope to eat our own cooking here another year from now that most of our seminar hosts will be from among our members. That's the proof that we're doing a good job, by the way. That's the report card. That's the proof that we're doing it right. Sure, yeah. And so we're starting to get there. And I think you said, are, are you planning on eventually having the se seminars who've gone far enough just not even have a, a leader? That's right. That's right. Our goal is our goal is by the time they've done their 36th seminar to cut their price back to the cost of the infrastructure in their books and they won't need a leader. They will probably, well, they'll figure out how to do it themselves, right? We'll we'll, we'll come up with some rules and some ways to help them figure it out, but you know, either, you know, what what group are you in? You're in 16? 12. You're in 12. So, hopefully here in 
another few months, another year and a half or something like that, your price will drop down to something like 30 bucks and $34, something like that. And then you guys can take turn, take turns right. leading your book discussions. And we do have materials. We have behind the scenes that you guys can't see. And we have some kind of interlocutors guides to these books that we can, that, uh, that our hosts use. And we'll, we'll provide you guys with, with some of those things. So, so we'll hopefully we'll be able to help you appoint leaders in your group and you guys can rotate in and out of that. We'll continue to offer some more training so that people will be able to do this stuff on their own. We'll just, and we'll just provide the schedules, the accountability stuff, the turn. It's, we still want it to be turnkey. We don't want anybody to have an excuse to not do the reading, right? We want the book to show up. We want them to know exactly what they read every single day. We want it to be them to have nothing to do but read and show up at the seminars. And so we'll continue to do that for the members. Then. That sounds great. How, have you figured out how long it's going to take to get through the entire canon at this, uh, at this speed? Oh gosh, you know it's a ten-year project. Oh, so you are you are on the ten-year plan more or less. Well, it's it's actually a little bit longer than that. The books, the the we're we're not reading that darn fast. Although, although in the first year, you know, in the first year, one of our our members will probably read around thirty-two hundred pages. Right, it's a pretty good sized stack. But Adler's ten-year plan is a little bigger than that. It would be faster than that. Are the people who started at the very beginning are they close to getting out of the Greeks and into the Romans now? Uh, they're knocking on it. They're more than halfway through. They're more than a third, uh, two thirds through. So the Greeks we read are Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Herodotus, Thucydides, Aristophanes, Plato, Aristotle, and then we'll read Plutarch's Lives of uh, Greeks and Romans, and then we get get into the Romans. Right. We read Cicero and Seneca and the Stoics and the Aeneid. And we move, then we kind of move out of those guys to uh, Plotinus, 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 uh, Augustine, Aquinas, etc. Great. Awesome. So uh, yeah, that, that seems like a good place to wrap it up. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. And for anybody who uh, wants to sign up, you just go to onlinegreatbooks.com and use the discount code Catholic Culture for 25% off your first three months. And uh, if you have the misfortune to uh, dilly-dally about long enough that you don't get in this enrollment period, you can get on the waiting list for the next one, which I think you said would be in April. I think so, yeah. Join the waiting list, and we send a whole bunch of stuff that would be useful to you if you wanted to start your own group. I always tell people that if you can have an in-person group, that's best, but it's darn, it's tough. Sure. It's tough to do that. You know, do you know eight people that, <laughs> that want to read these dirty books? Uh, hopefully you do. And if you do, you should start your own group. But if you join the VIP waiting list, we send you a bunch of stuff that might help help you do that. And start to found a group in your home if you can, or at your church or whatever. Maliki, one of our seminar hosts, he, he hosts, uh, I think he hosts two groups hmm. a month that meet in like area churches. So he's been doing that for decades. Hmm. So that's an option too. All right, Scott, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me on here. It's so much fun. I could talk about this stuff all yeah. day. In fact, I did. <laughs> Great. All right, thanks a lot. Today's reading will be that C.S. Lewis quote I mentioned to Scott earlier, which I dug up. It's from an article he wrote called Willing Slaves of the Welfare State. I believe a man is happier and happy in a richer way if he has the freeborn mind. But I doubt whether he can have this without economic independence, which the new society is abolishing. For economic independence allows an education not controlled by government, and in adult life it is the man who needs and asks nothing of government who can criticize its acts and snap his fingers at its ideology. Read Montaigne. That's the voice of a man with his legs under his own table, eating the mutton and turnips raised on his own land. Who will talk like that when the state is everyone's schoolmaster and employer? Admittedly, when man was untamed, such liberty belonged only to the few— I know. Hence the horrible suspicion that our only choice is between societies with few free men and societies with none. Okay, people, don't forget that the current enrollment period at Online Great Books is only open for another five days or so. So get on that if you're interested. And if you do happen to miss it, but you're still interested in enrolling, you can go on there and get on their waiting list for the next enrollment period, which will be in a few months. And if you have any questions about OGB, 
uh, or as always, any comments or suggestions about the podcast, please feel free to email me at podcast at catholicculture.org. And again, you can find the referral link for OGB at catholicculture.org slash episode 27. God bless you, and I'll see you next week. 